Today, we are answering the questions, what's inside Imogen's storm? What connections do the Loomis twins, Keyleth, Orem, and Imogen all have in common? And is the moon alive? Episode 19, I was not expecting this meeting with Istani to be as helpful and as information ridden as it actually was and had to very quickly start making notes. Istani studied celestial bodies at the university in Eos, where he also happened to specialize in Ruidus and how it affected the magical ley lines across Exandria so that magical practitioners could figure out the best times to do what kind of incantations and rituals. During this conversation, he mentioned some things that I'm going to repeatedly touch on in this video. One, Ruidus is very inconsistent. There is no pattern like there normally would be for a celestial body. Also, why does it glow at certain times? There is no answer. Once again, it's very inconsistent. And another thing is that it is constantly bombarded by storm. Not burying the lead here, holy buckets. And why are children who are born under the glowing of this red moon considered to be of ill omen. The group does ask at what time was the last flare of Ruidus and it was about two and a half years ago. Some babies born under this moon weren't even due at the time, but the flare supposedly caused their mother to go into premature labor. Those who were born under this moon are fated to be of ill omen because of some, I'd say probably cherry picked data. Famous people who have been born under a ruinous moon flare. Warren Dressig, who was the tyrant king of Tal'Dorei before Tal'Dorei was named Tal'Dorei after Zan Tal'Dorei killed Dressig in the Battle of the Umber Hills, and then it was named Tal'Dorei after her because she's such a badass. He is rumored to have been ruinous born, as was the human who eventually ascended and turned into the Mother of Ravens. There are also apparently signs that someone is ruinous born, i.e. they have strange markings on their body, they have odd premonitions, and strange dreams. Dreams. So how does Astani know the Loomis twins? The Loomis twins started writing to Astani when they were teenagers, asking questions about his research when he was in Eos. Eventually their relationship got to the point and their studies got to the point where they would come out to the hamlet in the Heartmoor, where they would talk with him and essentially swap theories, much like, you know, we do here, it's fine. The last time the twins came to visit, the time that they were killed, they mentioned the fact that they had been to a place called the Omen Archive, and oh dear lord, this is gonna be a can of worms. The Omen Archive is also in Eos, and they are trying to record all of the rudest born children. Nobody really knows why they're doing this. They're either attempting to dispel the superstitions around people who are rudest born, or just keep an eye on them, maybe for darker purposes. I am also bearing the lead here, stick with me. The twins had spoken of being rudest born themselves and showed signs of it. They had strange marks on their body, premonitions, and they had strange dreams. Guess who has this in common? Imogen. Imogen has lightning scars all the way up her arms. She also has premonitions and she also has strange dreams. The twins had something very important to talk to Astani the last time they came out to see him. However, they weren't able to broach the subject before they were attacked. The attackers descended from a tree in the Herald's Hill Garden, just like they did in the attack of Keyleth in Vesper. Brescia was able to cut down one and it melted into goo. This is reiterated by Astani, who also witnessed this. And the other two attackers fled south. Guess what's also in the south? <laughs> Eos. I'm really, really happy that the cast was kind of also in on this, perhaps being the lead here, because they start asking questions about where's Eos? Is it in the south? Yes, it is. Oh no. So the next thing we have to ask, were the twins actually Ruidus born and is Keyleth? That would be the only two factors tying these guys together. Other than the fact that the Loomis house is a middle high house of Mahan, but Keyleth is the leader of the Arashari. So I don't know of those. I mean, it's like you've got like queen versus like Archdukes. Saudi doesn't have any idea if either of them are actually Ruidus born because he only has like a couple of books that show high figures that are theory to be Ruidus born. Mm -hmm. Ashley actually beat me to the theory and I was screaming on Discord as she said it. Become a patron on Patreon and get access to me live screaming and writing in a book. And you can also sit there and scream with me if you like. That's not a very good sales pitch, I'm very sorry. I think the Omen Archive is tracking people who are Ruidus born and then attempting to assassinate them before they can fulfill their dark, terrible destiny. Basically, they've got a let's kill Hitler scheme without the time machine. What is inside Imogen's storm? That night they go back to Astani's house and he's got a big old telescope that they get to look through and they have a pretty clear shot of Ruidus tonight. And as Imogen looks through, she sees it being bombarded by storms that look identical to the ones from her nightmares. 
I am so excited because Chetney was right. The Red Storm does exist. Imjin also talks about the fact that the dreams come in a six month cycle, much akin to Ruidus's orbit, which takes about half a year to kind of move its way through the sky. They go back to their inn that night and Imogen has her nightmare. Matt at that time also describes the moon as a distant entity and he's really trying to drop these hints and I think, I think this is what he's hinting at and I really hope I'm right. This time, instead of running away from the storm, which is closer than it has ever been before, Imogen steps into it. She calls out for her mother. Her mother tells her to run. She says she doesn't want to run anymore and allows it to overtake her. And inside of it, she sees a figure, a female figure very specifically, and she can feel it smiling at her. She can only see like a silhouette, but she can feel this person smiling at her. As she's looking at this figure, other figures step out behind her. Laura asks later if it feels like it was a lot of people or one person with multiple presences. And Matt says it feels kind of like that, but you can't be sure. Ladna is also on the making of the dream journal. We love to see it. The storm has been coming to her closer and closer over many years as she has been kind of lucid dreaming. She says that she has control over herself, just not the environment. And at this point, she wonders if running is even the answer anymore. And I think that's a question on all of our minds. If she's even going to have the opportunity to run in the next iteration of the nightmare. I honestly don't think so. I think next time she has the nightmare, she's just going to be in the storm, facing down the exact same figures once again. Is the moon alive? For this, I wanted to go into the Taldori guide. And there's quite a good chunk in the Taldori guide on pages 9 and 10 if you want to go check my work and go look for yourself. According to the Taldori Reborn Guide, both moons are the domain of the Moonweaver, a capricious god of trickery and illusions. You'll remember the Moonweaver from Campaign 2 when our tag-in tried to basically shunt all of the newly amassed followers of his own godhood onto her because he didn't want to deal with it anymore. And that did not go well. Rudis is so surrounded by disquieting rumor and takes of misfortune that some believe another unknown god or power rules this small reddish brown moon. Just a complete another god. Are they locked behind the divine gate? Are they on this plane and just like chilling on the moon? Like everything's cool. I don't know. Cultures around the world tell of countless legends of prideful rulers who made grand plans or attempted deeds under the moon's full light when it shines brilliant vermilion rather than its usual ruddy color, and were forced to watch in horror as their endeavors fell to unforeseen misfortune. It is said those who fall afoul of Ruidus failed to give it its deference and its due, and so superstitious folk rarely dare to make plans while the full light of Ruidus shines above let alone enact them. Some forebode dark fortunes for those born under Ruidus, a curse of ill luck that will follow them throughout their lives. And this is mostly stuff that we've heard before, other than the God thing, oh boy. This next part is something that I am definitely latching onto. Though the cruel practice of moon sacrifice is no longer permitted in any of Taldori's cities, some far-flung settlements still secretly sacrifice children born under a full Ruidus to save them from a cursed life and to appease the dark, unknowable appetites of the Red Moon. Call your dad, you're in a cult. This is where I'm starting to think that the Omen Archive probably isn't just some sort of academic form. I'm pretty sure it's an academic cult. Ruidus and all the superstition that surrounds it feels like some kind of chaotic, evil omen bringer, cursed to bring all who fall under its life into a life of ill omen. And from this, all I can say is that if the superstition is real, the best evidence of this are the figures that Imogen sees as she stares into the storm. Are these dark entities or facets of a unknown smaller god trying to call her into some sort of weird blood pact because we do have blood domain moon clerics in the Taldori Reborn Guide. Or these figures could represent the cult that's trying to kill Ruid is born to either save the planet or save the children from their ill fate. Either way, don't, don't, no. <laughs> or are they representatives of Ruidus itself, staring upon the children born under its vermilion light? I don't, I don't have any answers. I think maybe the moon's alive. That's my best answer here. But what do you think? Is the moon alive? 
Is this a murder cult? And how do you think the heist is going? Because you know, knowing my upload schedule, it's already aired and I'm already madly scribbling notes. Don't at me. Leave your theories in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Make sure to boop the like on the video if you did like it and to subscribe to see more of my dumb face in your feed so you know when I upload a new theory video. Thank you so much to my patrons on Patreon, Ostrid, Brita, John, Nita, Klaus, and Lynette for making this video and all of my other videos possible. And I will see you next time for a freaking heist. We got another heist. Let's go.